President McAllister Wilson, Dean Oden, Right Reverend Mary, Marion Buddy, Reverend Dr. John R. Scholl, members of the Board of Governors, members of the faculty, staff, alumni, friends, parents, and most of all, Wesley Theolog Theological Seminary graduates of 2012. I want to thank David for his overly generous introduction and for his inv invitation to speak to you on this holy occasion inside this truly exquisite house of prayer. I do have one desire. Looking at the netting and remembering the recent history of the cathedral, if the earth should quake and the sky should fall and the cathedral should rain down its treasures on the pulpit, I want to be declared a martyr. You know, earlier this year in downtown Washington, I was invited to lunch with President McAllister Wilson and several faculty and friends of the seminary. Afterwards, we visited the Mount Vernon Square campus, the magnificent church, the dormitory, the classrooms, and I heard more about your expanding dreams for yourselves and for your seminary. It's really a high honor to be offering the commencement address to seminarians studying theology in our capital city, determined to engage the world for Christ and to preach the good news to people in great need of it. I find it especially exhilarating to address a graduating class representing 25 Christian denominations. As Pope John Paul emphasized in his encyclical Ut Unum Sin on commitment to ecumenism, we cannot proclaim the love of Christ without seeking the unity of all Christians. His message makes me especially grateful and humbled to be here today. You know, commencement is always a joyful time, and I find your graduation today especially inspiring. There is no law of motion in the physical universe that guaranteed that you would end up here today. More likely, the many demands of life were pushing you in the other direction, and you pushed back. Even if the Spirit called you here, the world did not make it easy to arrive. You fought your way here out of a conviction born of faith. Conviction. It is indispensable to every good deed. It defies the forces of inertia the prevailing winds and currents that fight to keep everything as it was or worse. Without conviction, there would be no hope. Conviction, however, is not all good. It can easily be corrupted by pride and greed and lead to hatred and division. Last year, here in Washington, D.C., our elected officials nearly shut down the government in April, nearly defaulted on the debt in August, nearly shut down the government over disaster relief in September failed to reach an accord for debt reduction in November, and forced another shutdown on the payroll tax in December. These stalemates prove that our elected officials do not suffer from a lack of conviction. But in many cases, they express their conviction as would a bitter couple seeking a divorce. 
using all manner of coercion to get the best deal. Dismissive of the misery their hatred would create, would create in their own lives and in the lives of their children. Yet we cannot responsibly blame politicians. The hostility did not originate with them. They are representing us. We in this country are in the midst of a social crisis, a harsh and deepening split between groups that are all too ready to see evil in each other. Each side has never been more eager, yet more unable to dominate the other. Both sides call for change, but each believes it is the other side that much must change. We cannot pretend to stand outside this. We're woven into it. We, the people, are exhibiting the human tendency that James Madison warned of in 1787 in Federalist Number 10, and I quote, a zeal for different opinions concerning religion concerning government, and many other points have divided mankind into parties, inflamed them with mutual animosity, and rendered them much more disposed to vex and oppress each other than to cooperate for the common good. Two hundred and twenty-five years later, we are like actors following the script for creating factions, develop strong convictions, group up with like-minded people, shun the others, play the victim, blame the enemy, stoke grievance, never compromise. At a time of expanding diversity of people and moral opinions, when we need more skill and wisdom engaging those with other views, we seem to be less skillful, less wise. So of all the questions posed in this campaign season, the most important one is rarely asked. Now, when this country is in increasingly diverse, when the number of disputed moral questions is rising, when citizens have deep and opposing passions that neither side will give up for the sake of civility, can citizens of the United States learn to express their convictions in more skillful, more respectful ways? We need an answer. A country whose citizens treat one another with scorn does not have a bright future. Many of you chose to come to a seminary in Washington, D.C. because you wanted to engage the world, live your faith, and learn how you can make an impact. I believe your faith can have a transforming impact on the world. Of all the graduates that entered the wider world this spring, you here today, more than others, have the responsibility and the training and the commitment to address the most urgent, most strategic challenge in our country today, the challenge of reducing hatred and promoting love. This is your calling. And it's the most urgent call of our times. For this is the message you've heard from the beginning. Love one another. So says the first letter of John. And the command to love is not only found in Scripture, but in our hearts. 
Love is the deepest human need. Every human being has a deep spiritual, psychological, emotional longing for love. And not to get it injures us deeply. Love is the greatest commandment, and hatred is at the heart of the greatest sins. Hatred is the great destroyer, the great divider. Hatred is more dangerous to us than any threat because it attacks the immune system of our society, our ability to seek, see danger, come together, and take action. Hatred poisons everything. Yet we seem not to see the danger. As Augustine wrote in his Confessions, it is strange that we should not realize that no enemy could be more dangerous than the hatred with which we hate him. If we can solve the problem of hatred, we have a chance to come together and solve all others. Now, I'd rather not admit any special intimacy with hatred. I'd like to say that I was familiar with it only from reading books and hearing confessions. But I must confess that much of what I know of hatred comes from examining the temptations of my own heart. So here are some personal reflections. First, we cannot reduce anyone else's hatred. If we were capable of reducing the hatred of others, we would already have done it. Most everyone would prefer that there were less hatred in the world, but there seems to be more, which is indirect proof that no one apparently wants to give up his or her own. Second, if we're going to do battle with hatred, we have to accept for practical purposes that hatred is not out there, it's in here. Ready to rise in disguise in sight of us, posing as virtue, sowing destruction. Third, to avail itself of the most effective disguise, hatred often hides in self-righteous conviction where it can be seen as driving e effort toward a noble goal. And that's why hatred is hard to see. It can hide from our conscience by entangling itself in our most noble beliefs. Let me offer an illustration. In 2009, a member of the armed forces was charged in a plot to commit murder. He had created a plan called Operation Patriot, complete with maps and photographs. In papers recovered by law enforcement, he had written that because he had taken an oath to protect the country against all enemies, foreign and domestic, he was obliged to honor that oath by killing the President of the United States. This young man fell prey to self-deception. He believed he was driven by a noble desire to protect the country when in fact he was driven by a deep hatred in the guise of patriotism. To spare ourselves from the same form of deceit, we have to call on our conscience to explore our convictions and how we express them. Even in the case of my most noble belief, I must ask myself, am I trying to advance this belief through persuasion or, or coercion with respect or contempt? by accepting sacrifice or imposing sacrifice. When I refuse to compromise, is it because I love a principle or because I hate the person on the other side? In 1749, after a series of riots in Ireland that included attacks on Methodists, John Wesley published an essay he entitled Letter to a Roman Catholic. He wrote, Are you not fully convinced that malice 
hatred, revenge, bitterness, whether in you or in us, whether in our hearts or in yours, are an abomination to the Lord. Be our opinions right or be they, they wrong, these tempers are undeniably wrong. They are the broad road that leads to destruction. This Roman Catholic has received John Wesley's letter, and I'm fully convinced of the manifest truth grounded, grounded in the gospel that it proclaims. If we are committed to reducing hatred in the world, then the way we engage one another in public debate is not the means to the end. The means are the end. And if we are determined to keep our convictions free of malice, then I propose that we meet one simple test for public discourse. Our attempts to express our convictions should take the form of an effort to persuade. If I'm confident of my beliefs, and if I have love and goodwill for the other side, then it is my duty to try to persuade them. And if I want to persuade them, then how can I vilify them? People are not persuaded by those who attack their character. But if I don't try to persuade, but only condemn them, then I am not showing the respect that love demands to stand apart, proclaim my position, and refuse to talk except to judge does not reduce hatred or promote love, and if it does, neither. How can it be inspired by God? The moment I venture into tone and language that is unlikely to persuade, it can be a signal that I have left the sphere of respectful discourse. Once I do that, my odds of plunge of winning over another and the chances rise that I am expressing hatred, which will lead to factions and fracture the common good, and with the common good fractured any individual good is a very fragile hope indeed. The dangers all around us. Hatred is rising, yet all sides feel more virtuous. We're steeped to the threat. We can have the most sophisticated constitution, a brilliant system of checks and balances and a bill of rights to safeguard against the tyranny of the majority, yet none of it can stand against the power of hatred. It can all be thrown down. As you set out on your ministry, I ask you to affirm the noble beliefs that led you here and advance those beliefs in ways that strike a moral contrast to the dominant discourse of our country today. If you do this, you will set a new standard for moral conviction in the 21st century, one that will offer hope of reconciling two great human needs, our longing to give full expression to our most passionate convictions and the need for a national unity that can survive the diversity of views. So let me close with a story known to you all. Driven by the desire to bring good news to the poor, to proclaim release to captives, to recover sight to the blind, to let the oppressed go free, Wesley Seminary began planning a new campus in downtown Washington, D.C., right at the intersection of poverty and power. In late 2008, the votes had been taken, the plans were set, the shovels were ready, and the financial crisis struck. Investment houses vanished, the stock market was losing half its value, universities saw their endowments plunge, 
and their donors step back. President McAllister Wilson, the board, the faculty of Wesley had one last chance to turn back. They conferred. They prayed. They pondered the wisdom of giving up the seminary's financial security in stern economic times. But ultimately, they asked one another, does the world now need our witness and service less or more? And so the seminary that taught you, that steeped you in the theology and practice of passionate Christianity pushed ahead as the whole world pulled back. Could there be any better inspiration for your ministry? Go now. Become worthy sons and daughters of your seminary. Inspired by its example, go preach love. Stand against the momentum of your times and renew the face of the earth. Thank you.